Good morning, everyone. It's uh, great to be in God's Word together to continue in Matthew's Gospel. Uh, fantastic um, time last week, and we're going to be continuing through the term, so make sure you grab your daily reading notes, and uh, we'll be kicking off growth groups this week, which will be fantastic. Uh, but let's pray together. Uh, Father, we thank you so much that uh, in times of uncertainty, we can trust you. Uh, you're a loving Father. You're with us. Uh, that you're in control of all things and uh, we have certainty about our future because of the Lord Jesus. Uh, please, Father, this morning, speak to us through your word, nurture our faith, grow us, encourage us, challenge us. And we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Uh, well, I have to say, I don't like situations um, where there's heat, where there's conflict, where people get angry at me. Um, I think most people don't like that, but um, I find I particularly don't like that. Now, sometimes it's necessary uh, for the cause of the gospel, uh, for the work of the gospel requires it, but I tend to not like it. There seem to be some people who do, but not many. Now, at first glance, when you look at this passage, it can look like a bunch of people getting angry or losing their temple, the temper. Jesus comes into the temple courts in Jerusalem and he drives out those buying and selling there and he overturns tables of the money changers and those selling the doves and he has strong words to say. It's obvious by his actions, by his words, that he's angry. After this, the Jewish religious leaders, the chief priests and the teachers of the Lord, they're angry with Jesus. They've seen him doing these things in the temple courts. They've seen him then healing the blind and the lame who came to Jesus in the temple. They see the children shouting praise to Jesus and Jesus doesn't stop them. And they're indignant, it says, angry. After these events, Jesus leaves the city for the night. He goes out to Bethany and in the morning he returns. He's coming back to the city, back to the temple in order to teach in the temple courts again, which he does uh, each day of that last week of his life. He's hungry as he comes in. He sees a fig tree. It has leaves, but when he comes close, it has no fruit for him to eat. And he says, may you never bear fruit again. And it withers and dies. He uses his mighty God-given power to destroy this fig tree because it doesn't give him any breakfast. He's angry, it looks like. Perhaps he's even hangry. I'm sure you get hangry. I get hangry. Sometimes I'm irritated and angry. And my wife says to me, do you want something to eat? And I say, no, I don't want... Okay, and I eat and then I return to normal, like the Snickers ad. Is that Jesus here? Is he throwing a tantrum because he's hungry and the food he's expecting on the fig tree just isn't there? At first glance, this could look like a passage uh, with a bunch of people who are losing their temper, Jesus included. Some people have even suggested that Jesus' anger here is in some way demeaning, pathetic, ugly. But can I suggest that what is taking place in this passage is actually something huge, it is a huge moment in the history of the world. Now, not the hugest, but still a huge moment. See, a, a gigantic wave has been roaring across all of human history. It's the wave of promise. It's the wave of God's promises. The wave began in the Garden of Eden with the first promise, the promise that God would one day restore relationship with him and restore his broken world. And from there, from that promise, this wave of promise has built and built and gained speed and momentum and grown as it's moved across the pages of history as more and more promises have been made and added. Sometimes promise, sometimes prophecy, sometimes a pattern of something that's going to come, sometimes strengthening and adding detail to promises already made, sometimes new promises or new additions to promises that were before hidden. But rolling across the pages of the Old Testament is this huge and growing wave of promise. And at its heart, it has this. One day, the king will come. And when the king comes, he will bring God's uncontested rule to be restored into this world, bringing salvation, bringing judgment, making all things right. As we hit the New Testament, the arrival of Jesus on the scene, the wave peaks the wave shifts from being a wave of promise to reaching its fulfillment point. It starts to break. The king has come. All these promises, prophecies, patterns we see in the Old Testament start to come to fulfillment. And Matthew, the writer of this gospel, goes out of his way to show this. And through the period of Jesus' ministry, almost three years, the wave has tipped and is starting to be fulfilled. It's starting to break. It's on its downwards movement. God's promises are coming to fulfillment. And yet... For that three-year period, it holds and it holds and it holds 
until it gets to this last week of Jesus' life. At this point, the wave wedges out. Fulfillments start coming thick and fast. With the coming of Jesus, the king to his city, Jerusalem, which we saw last week, and coming to his temple, which we're going to look at today, the wave wedges out. Fulfillments coming in, in greater number and fullness until at the end of this week, Jesus will be executed, buried, and then resurrected from the dead. And in his death and resurrection, the wave will come down and every promise will be yes in Christ Jesus. The wave of fulfillment crashes and all God's promises are fulfilled. See, this moment here in this passage we have before us, Matthew 21, these events, Jesus coming to his city, coming to his temple, to which the cursing of the fig tree is connected, is a huge moment where this wave of fulfillment wedges out, launching forward. It's a huge moment, particularly around worship, the fulfillment of worship, what it means to appropriately connect with God and relate to God rightly, worship. Let's look together at this event and why it's so huge, particularly concerning the worship of God. Now, I've got three reasons why this is so huge for the worship of God. The first reason that this is a huge moment is because the Lord has come to his temple to purify the worship of God. The Lord has come to his temple to purify the worship of God. Come back with me to that passage that was read before, Malachi chapter 3. Just one book back, last book of the Old Testament. Malachi chapter 3, verse 1. It says, I'll send my messenger who will prepare the way before me. Now that's John the Baptist when it comes to fulfillment. I will send my messenger who will prepare the way before me, John the Baptist. Then suddenly the Lord you are seeking will come to his temple. The messenger of the covenant who you desire will come, says the Lord Almighty. And this moment that we're looking at in Matthew's gospel, Matthew 21, where Jesus comes to the temple, is that moment. Suddenly the Lord will come to his temple. Jesus is that Lord, that ruler, that messenger of the covenant, come on God's behalf to his temple. But do you notice this Lord, this king comes to, it says, his temple. And in that very first sentence, the messenger who will come before him, who does that messenger prepare the way for? See the first sentence of verse 1? He prepares the way for me, says God. He prepares the way for God to come. There's a lovely ambiguity in Malachi chapter 3. Is the Lord, the ruler who will come, going to be the king or ruler who so represents God that when he comes, it's like God has come because he represents him so well? Or is it hinting at even more? that this king who comes to his temple is actually God himself come to the temple. The king is God. Well, what will this Lord do when he comes to the temple? Have a look at verse 2, Malachi 3, verse 2. But who can endure the day of his coming? Who can stand when he appears? For he will be like a refiner's fire or a launderer's soap. He will sit as a refiner and a purifier of silver. He will purify the Levites and refine them like gold and silver. Then the Lord will have men who bring offerings in righteousness and the offerings of Judah and Jerusalem will be acceptable to the Lord as in days gone by, as in former years. So I will come to you and put you on trial. I'll be quick to testify against sorcerers, adulterers and perjurers, against those who defraud laborers of their wages, who oppress the widows and the fatherless and deprive the foreigners among you of justice. But do not fear me, says the Lord Almighty. See, what will the Lord do when he comes to his temple? He'll refine, he'll purify, he'll wash it clean like a refiner's fire, a fire that burns so hot that it melts metal and the dross sinks to the bottom and the scum goes to the top and the scum and the dross can be skimmed off and thrown away and all that will remain is the pure gold or the pure silver. Or like a launderer's soap. I remember reading the King James many, many years ago and it says like Fuller's soap. My last name's Fuller. Like my brand of soap. No, no, a fuller is a launderer, a purifier. He will scrub the people of God and their worship so that it is so white and so pure and so clean. It's like it's been soaked in nappy sand for days. He will wash away their corrupt and evil practices, their offerings polluted by ungodly lives. He will judge godlessness and wickedness and oppression and lovelessness and he will make the worship of God pure. A worship of God that comes from faith 
and flows into obedience of life, fruit. And in our passage, Matthew 21, when King Jesus comes to his temple, immediately he cleanses it, driving out those buying and selling there, turning over tables of the money changers and those selling doves. Now, it's symbolic. Jesus doesn't really cleanse the temple by disrupting and destroying the market in the temple. But it's a symbol of what is to come in his death and resurrection. By his death and resurrection, there will come a total purification of the worship of God, a way where people can come directly into the presence of God and be pure before him, and where judgment will fall only upon those who reject him and that. In Malachi 3, what we see is the Lord will come to his temple and he will cleanse his people of their corrupt worship and bring about purity to how people worship God. Now come back to chapter 21 of Matthew if, if you're not already there. There's a couple of other little pieces here that shout that the Lord has come to his temple. See there in verse 14, the blind, the lame, they come into the temple courts, they come to Jesus and he heals them. Now if you're a Jew and you knew your Old Testament, it shouts Isaiah 35. <laughs> Isaiah 35 is a picture of the new life and restoration of the world that will come when God comes to save. What will happen when God comes? When God comes, Isaiah 35 says, the eyes of the blind will be open, the ears of the deaf will be unstopped, the lame will leap like a deer, and it's imagery of restoration, healing of the world, all things being made right. And here is Jesus, the king, comes to his temple, the blind and the lame come to him, and he heals them. A picture that the Lord has come to bring salvation and restore all things. The other little piece that shouts that the Lord has come to his temple is the interaction around the children. See, there's children there. They see the wonderful things that Jesus is doing, these healings that are taking place. And they pick up the shouts that they've heard the adults shouting, praising God as Jesus entered Jerusalem. Hosanna to the son of David, the children are crying out. The Jewish leaders see this and they're angry with Jesus. They're angry that he's cleared the temple. They're angry that he's been healing in the temple courts. They're angry that the children are praising him like this and he's not stopping them. And Jesus responds in verse 16 with a quote. It's a quote from Psalm 8. And the quote says this, From the lips of children and infants, you, Lord, have called forth your praise. In the psalm, that verse indicates how right and appropriate it is for children to praise God. In fact, God has ordained it that children should praise him. Jesus takes this and he applies it to himself. Now, is he saying that he is so much God's representative, it's right that God be praised for his work that he's carrying on? Or is it, I think, something even more? It's right that you praise me. It's right that these children praise me, for I am God. Either way, this marks a huge moment. The Lord has come to his temple and he will once and for all bring purity to the worship of God. Second reason. Second reason this is a huge moment is because it exposes the failure of humanity to worship God appropriately. In this passage, what we see is the failure of, God, of humanity to worship God appropriately is exposed. And this is where Jesus' anger around the market uh, in the temple courts and around the fruitlessness of the fig tree comes in. See, why is Jesus so angry when he encounters the market in the temple courts? Because in one sense, the market served a purpose. When Jewish pilgrims traveled from vast distances across the land of Palestine to come to Jerusalem, they were coming to God's city, to God's temple in order to make sacrifice for their sins and also to pay the temple tax. This particularly happened at festival times, like the Passover festival, which was happening right at the moment. Where in, in this period where Jesus is engaging in the temple and through this last week of his life. Jerusalem swelled at these times to, by hundreds of thousands of pilgrims coming in to celebrate the Passover festival and make sacrifice at the temple. But if you travelled such a long distance, you didn't want to bring your animals for sacrifice with you. And so instead you'd bring money. And when you got to Jerusalem, you'd buy your animal sacrifice, then take it to the temple and make the sacrifice. They also need to exchange their money for a couple of reasons. They might have mixed currency. 
that's come from other nations and may have images of false gods stamped on it. You wouldn't bring that money into the temple to pay the temple tax. But the main reason was the temple tax needed to be paid in Tyrian coinage, a trusted standard weight coinage, which was what required by the temple tax. And so they needed to exchange any other currencies into that one. And so in some sense, the market was a needed thing for the buying of sacrificial animals and a coin exchange was a real need. But it seems that what had taken place was this market, which is outside the temple, that had for many years been on the Mount of Olives away from the temple, had in recent times been moved into the temple courts, the outer court of the temple, the court of the Gentiles, the place where only non-Jews could go, uh, the only place that non-Jews could go and pray to the Lord. It seems that the religious leaders had worked out if we move the market into the temple, we can take a cut of everything that's going on. Now, were there unjust practices going on and people ripping each other? Perhaps, we just don't know. But in the very place where people were to come and access God, the temple, the only place that people could most fully draw near to God, pray to God, they had placed a market for their financial benefit. And it basically stopped the Gentiles, the non-Jews, from having anywhere that they could come and worship God because there was a market in the only court in the temple they could come to. It stopped them from being able to draw near to God in prayer. And for everyone else, they had to walk through this marketplace as they moved into the inner courts of the, the temple. And no doubt the noise echoed and carried through. However, what's at the very heart of this issue for Jesus? Well, you can see what Jesus thinks is at the heart of the issue by the two contrasting Old Testament passages that he refers to. In one, he refers to the purpose of the temple. In the other, he refers to how they were using the temple. One refers to what the temple was meant to be used, how it was meant to be used, the other, what they had made it to be. And there's a startling contrast. Firstly, you can see in verse 13, he refers to Isaiah 56 when he says, it is written, my house will be called a house of prayer. Now we won't go there. But Isaiah 56 is a wonderful promise filled with promises to outsiders to Israel. Promises to any who are on the outside, to the eunuch, to the foreigner, to the Gentile. Any on the outside who, if they would draw near to God, will find a place with God and an everlasting future. And at the temple, their sacrifices will be acceptable, even though they're outsiders, for God's temple will be called a house of prayer for all nations. What was the temple? Well, it was a house. It was God's house, the place where God chose to dwell. And it was a house of prayer, a house of talking to God, of access to God, of coming into the presence of God. Now, God obviously did not live in the temple. <laughs> he is everywhere and rules over everything. But in grace to his chosen people, Israel, he had chosen to, to live in their midst, to have a house amongst their houses, God living amongst his people. But because God is so holy and pure and people are so sinful, he could only do it through the temple with its priests that mediated between God and the people and sacrifices, animal sacrifices that symbolically paid for sin. The temple was the means by which people could come near, draw near to God, pray to him. And wherever the Israelites were in the world, they turned to face the temple and prayed towards the temple, acknowledging that this was their access to God. It was a house of prayer, a place for God's people to draw near to God in prayer, in sacrifice for their sins, in repentance for their wrong they had done. And Isaiah 56 looks forward to a day where not only Israel can draw near to God, but all can draw near to God, all the nations. That's the original purpose, a place for God's people to draw near to God in prayer. But, says Jesus, verse 13, you are making it a den of robbers. And the language is actually even stronger. You are making it a cave of insurrectionists, a hideout for murderers. And the quote comes from Jeremiah 7, and it's worth looking at together. This is the last um, place we'll go in the Old Testament. But come back with me. Jeremiah chapter 7. It's worth looking at because... History is repeating itself. Jeremiah chapter 7, verse 1. 
This is the word that came to Jeremiah from the Lord. Stand at the gate of the Lord's house and there proclaim this message. So God says to Jeremiah, go and stand at the gate of the Lord's house at the front of the temple and proclaim this message. And the message is, hear the word of the Lord, all you people of Judah who come through these gates to worship the Lord. This is what the Lord Almighty, the God of Israel says, reform your ways and your actions and I will let you live in this place. Do not trust in deceptive words and say, this is the temple of the Lord, the temple of the Lord, the temple of the Lord. If you really change your ways and your actions and deal with each other justly, if you do not oppress the foreigner and the fatherless or the widow and do not shed innocent blood in this place, and if you do not follow other gods to your own harm, then I will let you live in this place, in the land I gave your ancestors forever and ever. But look, you are trusting in deceptive words that are worthless. Will you steal and murder and commit adultery and perjury and burn incense to Baal and follow other gods you have not known and then come and stand in this house which bears my name and say, we are safe, safe to do all these detestable things. Has this house which bears my name become a den of robbers to you? But I've been watching, declares the Lord. See, way back in the time of Jeremiah, the prophet, Jeremiah is called by God to confront the people of Israel in the temple. And the key problem is they are living however they wanted, in utter disobedience to God, and yet they thought they were safe because they had the temple. We're God's people. We have God's temple right here. We're good with God. We're safe from his judgment. They are treating the temple like a, a magic talisman, a magic object that meant they were safe no matter how they lived are committing adultery, perjury, idolatry, violence, stealing, and yet they thought we are safe. We have the temple of the Lord, the temple of the Lord, the temple of the Lord. It's a bit like um, get out of jail free card. Uh, you know, when you play Monopoly, my kids were playing Monopoly yesterday. When you play Monopoly, if you're going really well, you look down and you see your wads of cash sitting in front of you, your property portfolios spread out, all your houses and your hotels on all your properties. And you might even have a, a community chest or chance card, which is a get out of jail free card. And basically it means you never need to be worried about stuck in jail, missing your turns. Because if you land on jail, jail you pull out, you get, a, get out of jail free card and boom, you're free. Don't have to pay anything. Don't have to stay in jail. You're free. The Israelites of Jeremiah's time led by their religious leaders, were treating God's temple as an unlimited get-out-of-jail-free card. Lived however they wanted, in disobedience to God, in godlessness, in selfishness, and yet they thought, we're fine. We have the temple of the Lord, the temple of the Lord, the temple of the Lord. God is with us. And so God's temple had become a den of robbers to them, a hideout where wicked people came together in safety, God's house, the place that bore God's holy name, the place where sinful people could only draw near to the holy God through animal blood sacrifice. That's how serious it was, sin was. And yet God's Old Testament people were treating it as a safe place for wicked, godless, unrepentant people to gather together, a den of robbers, a safe hiding place for the godless. And Jesus, in taking this phrase draws attention to all this background. History is repeating itself. In fact, not just repeating itself. This was unfortunately consistently the sort of attitude to the temple that the nation of Israel defaulted to. The Jews in Jesus' day, led by the, the religious leaders, are treating the temple of the Lord in exactly the same way, a get-out-of-jail-free card, an unlimited get-out-of-jail-free card, a hiding spot for the godless. They lived however they wanted, and they thought, we're cool because we have the temple of the Lord. Get our jail free card. And the market in the temple of the Lord is emblematic of all this, symbolic of all this. And so Jesus fires up in righteous anger, not flying off the handle in uncontrolled rage. No, no, no. Severe, controlled, right, just, good, holy anger at the evil he sees taking place. There is no fruit in the nation of Israel. No godlessness of life apart from amongst a very small few. No faith that leads to obedience to God. Just self-centered, 
interest, self-interest covered by religiosity, hypocrisy. And over the coming chapters, Jesus is going to deal with that, confront that head on. Which is why Jesus is angry at the fig tree and curses it. Not hangry, not a temper tantrum, an enacted parable. See, come back with me to Matthew 21. We'll stay there now if you're you're not back there. The fig tree is a common symbol of the nation of Israel throughout the Bible. And here Jesus comes to a fig tree expecting fruit. There's leaves on the fig tree, which apparently when the fig tree had leaves, there should be fruit. He comes to it and finds no fruit. The fig tree promises but fails to deliver. This is the nation of Israel, particularly led and exampled by their religious leaders. They should have borne fruit, a life of faith leading to obedience to God, godliness of life, prayerfully approaching God in faith. Instead, they lived however they wanted and they treated the temple like an unlimited get out of jail free card. And so Jesus curses the fig tree and it withers and dies. The symbolism, this is the end of the nation of Israel as God's people. And in the coming chapters, this will be made even more explicit. God's people will no longer be the nation of Israel, but will instead be all those who receive God's King Jesus by faith, put their trust in him. Which includes those of the nation of Israel who put their trust in Jesus, but it also includes all from the nations who will put their trust in Jesus, all who have faith. And the religious leaders are blowing it even here. Look at how they treat God's king when he comes on God's behalf to God's temple to bring purification. Here is the king fulfilling the prophecy of Malachi, cleansing the worship of the people of God, healing the blind and the lame, fulfilling Isaiah 35, the children praising him in line with Psalm 8, and the religious leaders are indignant, angry. God's king has come to bring purity to the worship of God and they're angry with him. And their anger will only grow over the coming chapters until it leads to Jesus' death. They kill him. This is a huge moment because it exposes firstly the failure of the Jewish religious leaders and the bulk of the nation of Israel as they follow their leaders. But it also exposes the failure of all humanity to worship God appropriately. See, their failure is a picture of our failure, of all humanity's failure. The Jewish nation had every blessing and advantage and they blew it. They had the temple of God. They had the promises of God. No other nation had that and they blew it. God with them and they blew it. If they blew it, how much more will all other humans always blow it? They are a lesson for us. Imagine this, a young group of athletes, uh, pretty good, but they're not elite. But they all think they're amazing. They're about the same ability. They're about the same potential. They think they're amazing. They think they're incredible. They think they're going to go to the Olympics and win gold. They're deluded. They're not that good. They're never going to be that good. As a lesson, you take one of them, one out of the 20. And that one, you give every advantage. Professional coaches, limitless free training, the best equipment, dietary advice, supplement supplement plans, tailored preparation for the big race, and then you let them compete in the big race, perhaps the qualifier for the Olympics. And you invite along the whole rest, those other 19 athletes to come and watch this one athlete who has had every advantage. And this one athlete competes, all the training, all the equipment, all the expertise, all the preparation competes and loses big time, fails epically. What should this teach the rest of the group watching along? If that athlete who had every advantage and every benefit failed so miserably, I would have too. We all would have. We all have. The failure of the nation of Israel to worship God appropriately is the failure of all humanity, a lesson that shows the failure of all humanity. If they who had the promises and the covenants and the law and the temple and God living with them and the sacrifices could rebel and dive into sin and think we're okay because we have the temple of the Lord. Aren't we all like that? Every human fails to honour God the way he requires. And when religion is involved, it's filled with pride or it's false and man-made or it's used as an unlimited get out of jail free card. This is a huge moment because it exposes the failure of humanity to worship God appropriately and particularly the failure of Israel led by its leaders to worship God appropriately. And so marks the end 
for them as God's people. Third, the third reason this is a huge moment is that it signals the beginning of pure and unrestricted worship of God for all people everywhere. It signals pure and unrestricted worship of God for all people everywhere. Remember the Malachi passage? Jesus the Lord has come to his temple to bring pure worship to all people. And then he cleanses the temple by driving out the market as a symbol, an indicator of the temple's ultimate fate. In the next few chapters as we move through, Jesus will make clear that this physical temple is going to be destroyed. It's going to be rubble, which eventually takes place in 70 AD. The Jews rise up against the Romans. The Romans send legions to come and conquer them. They put down the Jewish rebellion. They destroy the physical temple in Israel, in Jerusalem. And all that remains today in Jerusalem is the Wailing Wall. You can go and see it. The temple is destroyed. But something better than the temple is coming. A better means of worshipping God, a better means of access to God, a pure worship of God. Jesus has already said in chapter 12 that something greater than the temple is here. Now, if you're a Jew, something greater than the temple? Him. He's greater than the temple. In a few chapters' time, we'll see the moment of his death on the cross. And in that moment of his death on the cross, the curtain in the temple will be torn in two from top to bottom. Incredibly thick curtain. The curtain that separated the most holy place, the place where God's presence dwelled from the whole rest of the temple and from from the rest of the world. God separated. In this action, in Jesus' death, God tearing the curtain of the temple, he's, he's performing a powerful symbol. And the meaning of the symbol is this. There is now unrestricted access to God. The holy place is opened up. We can all come into the presence of God directly by faith in the death of Jesus. There's now no holy city, Jerusalem, or holy temple, because Jesus, by his sacrificial death, has made sacrifice for all the sins of all people who have faith in him. And so a temple with its sacrifices is no longer needed. Because Jesus paid for all sin of all who would trust in him and washed them clean once and for all so that they are perfectly pure in God's sight. And so now these people can come directly to God through Jesus because sin no longer prevents it. It's been cleansed away. There is now unrestricted access to God by faith in the Lord Jesus and his death and resurrection. Access to God by faith in Jesus for all people everywhere, not just Jews. Not just in Jerusalem, not just at the temple. No, all people, everywhere, anywhere can now come to God by faith in Jesus. Jesus becomes the true temple, the true place where God lives because he is God. The place where once and for all, all sacrifice has been made for all the sins of all the people. The place where we come to God, trust Jesus, and you come into a sin, sinless into the presence of God. And you can pray as someone who knows their prayers will be answered. Did you notice that in this passage, the blind and the lame come into the temple? They wouldn't have been allowed there. The Jewish religious leaders would have kicked them out. They were seen as outsiders, cut off from the blessings of God, unclean. But they come into the temple and they find Jesus, the true temple. And so instead of being driven away from God, away from the temple, Jesus heals them, restores them, brings them near to God once and for all. No longer exclusion, a wonderful picture. Any person who has faith in Jesus, no matter how far away, no matter how much of an outsider, no matter what religion they have been part of, no matter how bad they might have been, evil can be washed clean by Jesus' death and brought near into the presence of God forever. Whoever you are, you are not too far from God. Trust Jesus' death to deal with your sins, and you'll be brought near into an eternal relationship with the living God. And this worship that Jesus brings us into is a life of faith that shows itself in obedience. A life of faith, which is why I think in verses 21 and 22, Jesus talks about the power of coming to God in prayer by faith. Faith is the big thing he's emphasizing here. Faith means we have access to God in prayer 
and God answers to prayer are powerful. As in chapter 17, it's not a blank check. A prayer of faith, a prayer that's out of trust in God, will be praying the things that God desires and these are the things that he will bring about mightily, not prayers of selfishness. A life of worshipping God is a life of faith, of trust, that comes to God prayerfully, asking of him, depending on him. That's what connects us to God. Faith in Jesus, trust in Jesus. And when someone lives this life of faith, of trust, it's a life of growing obedience to the one they trust, Jesus. These are the sort of worshippers that God is making. Pure in God's sight by the death of Jesus and being made pure, more and more pure every day in reality by God's power. It's a worship that changes people's lives from the inside out that God wants. Let me finish with three applications. The first is this. Recognize that worship of God is both profoundly inclusive and profoundly exclusive. It's profoundly inclusive because it's for all people. Every language, every color, every nation, every tribe, every culture, anyone who puts their faith in Jesus, anyone on this planet puts their faith in Jesus, is able to come into a relationship with God. There are no special people or special race or special place or special ritual that you have to go through or do. Or That's a powerful message in our divided world. All people. And there are people all over the world of every color, of every race, of every culture in a relationship with the holy God of the universe through faith in Jesus. And they are our brothers and sisters. Profoundly inclusive, but profoundly exclusive. There's one way to come to God. Faith in Jesus. There is no other way. There was only one way in the old covenant. One temple. One place of access to God by God's command. Same in the new covenant. There's one temple, Jesus. One place where God dwells, Jesus. One place where your sins can be dealt with by sacrifice, Jesus. You come to that one place by putting your faith in Jesus. Trust him. Now that is a challenge for our world. No other way. No other way to be saved from God's judgment. Profoundly inclusive, profoundly exclusive. Do you believe this? Because it drives the next application. Application two. Have a heart for all people to come to God. It is God's great desire for all people, all types, all cultures, all nations to come to him. This has always been his great plan and great desire. Is it ours? That all people everywhere would come to God through faith in Jesus and be saved. Worship is inclusive. It is open to all. Worship of God is exclusive. It is only through faith in Jesus. This drives our mission, God's mission, to take the gospel to all people because it's for all and to do it with urgency because it's only by putting faith in Christ that we'll be saved. Is this your great desire? To support and contribute to see as many people put their faith in Jesus and come to God as possible, both on the coast and across the world, both people from our tribe and our culture, but also people from every tribe and every culture, to support our mission partners overseas, our church plants in Australia, mission work as it goes on, wherever it goes on, a key piece as we contribute to that. To support the work locally as we're endeavouring to see people brought to faith in Jesus and we all contribute to that. It's the body of Christ using our different gifts to see people come to faith in Jesus and continue to grow in him. Even the way we think about the people around us, Are we limited in the way we think about who needs to be helped to come to faith in Jesus? Just the people like me? Just the people I hang out with? Just the people who I like being with? Just the people who are my friends? Or could we be more conscious to engage more widely? There is no person too far from God. Or too different from me. Or too religious or too non-religious or too all need Jesus and are welcome to come to God by faith in him. The coast is changing. There are more people from different nationalities and backgrounds moving to the coast. This is wonderful. This is a great opportunity for us to embrace seeing people of every tribe and language and nation brought to faith in Christ within our local area. And we're finding that it's often people from other racial and cultural backgrounds who are the most receptive to the gospel, are the most hungry. 
May God bring a great harvest of people from every nation and tribe and language to worship him by faith in Jesus. I mean, may he do that on the coast as well. Third application. Beware having a get-out-of-jail-free card. Beware treating something as a get-out-of-jail-free card. An example of a get-out-of-jail-free card is having prayed the sinner's prayer. Having prayed at one time to become a Christian, but then going on and living your life however you want. You live your life out of self-interest, oriented around your desires, and growing love and growing obedience and growing faith in absent. But you think, I'm okay, because I prayed the prayer to become a Christian. The sinner's prayer, the sinner's prayer, the sinner's prayer, the temple of the Lord, the temple of the Lord, the temple of the Lord. Don't think that having prayed the sinner's prayer or a prayer to become a Christian once will keep you safe if you do not have a life of faith, which is bearing the fruit of faith, growing obedience. Another example of a get-out-of-jail free card is regularity or semi-regularity at church, or in this case, on the live stream. So it's possible to treat regularity at church or semi or on the live stream as a magical talisman that keeps me safe with God, regardless of how I live for the rest of the week. To live however you want, without reference to God all week, and yet come to church at the stream and think, I'm safe. Beware. If Jesus came to your fig tree, what would he see? Fruit? No fruit. If you came to be a Christian, there's leaves on the tree. There is the expectation that you will bear fruit. True worship of God always results in fruit. A life of faith always results in the fruit of growing obedience to Jesus. If your life is not growing fruit, beware. Pray with faith that the Lord would do an amazing work in your life, that he would move mountains, that he would change you from the inside out to be a person of deepening faith, which results in great love and obedience of God. But beware even more if you are not bearing fruit and you are unconcerned because you think there's something that keeps you safe. You think you've got to get out of jail free card. There's a great quote by the Prince of Preachers, Charles Spurgeon. If your religion doesn't make you holy, it will damn you. It's just painted pageantry to go to hell in. Brilliant words, wonderful words, terrifying words. If your religion doesn't make you holy, it will damn you. It is just painted pageantry to go to hell in. Let's pray. Oh, Father, we thank you so much for your son, the Lord, that he's come to his temple and that he's purified the worship of all people because humanity has failed so profoundly in worshipping you. Thank you that his death and resurrection purify us in your sight so that we can now live freely in your presence day by day by faith. And please, Lord, bear in every one of us the fruit of faith, a life of growing obedience, a life that honours you. Amen.